All right, everybody. We are about to start the lightning talks. We have. Um, I think we have 12, maybe 13 of them, depending on, or less, depending on who actually shows up. Um, so, whoa, okay, we got loud. These are going to be five minutes apiece, and we're going to be really, really strict on the time because we have 60 minutes total, and 12 times 5 is 60. So, uh, the first up is Rocky Bernstein, who's going to talk about the Emacs debugger interface rewrite. So you want the, here you go, Rocky. Oh, I hate this. Uh, so, yeah, okay, that, that'd be great. Uh, what, I, what I was hoping to do, will that, Will that show anything? Since I'm really bad at giving uh, extemporaneous talks, I was going to just, I, I made a screen case cast special for this. Uh, and let me, let me stop this right here. Uh, the most important thing is I wanted to actually thank uh, two people here, Yarek here, and I see Clint, who's not just, uh, skipping. okay, Clint Adams, who, and so I, I apologize for not putting Clint's package there, which is ZSHDB. Uh, I'm not a Debian packager, I am uh, trout spawn, or what you call upstream. Um, so I just write code. Uh, okay, so, so let's go. Is this thing, so, so th th is this playing? Can we, can we see that that's playing? Press what? Press this one? Is it going? Is it going? No, 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 the Grand Unified Debugger, so this is all going to be about that. Here's how to install. It's not a package yet, uh, but I hope somebody will do that. Um, right, that's links for installing. Uh, okay, to load it, you do load library. So once, you, once you've installed it, which is kind of arduous, you do load library. Get the, so now you have access to a bunch of commands that start dbgr dash. Uh, and uh, there, mo most of the commands start dbgr dash, but a couple debuggers start don't don't start like that. And what I'm going to show is the Python, uh, a new Python debugger that I've been working on, uh, because I knew that there were there might be two pe Python people here, and I didn't, forgot about Clint. Uh, so you do that, a meta x pyb dbgr, okay, and then. Uh, this is a prior invocation, but what's going, uh, uh, but uh, the way it figures out the GCD 3.5, that's how it got that, but it'll, it'll look at the buffer. If your buffer is Python buffer, it'll use that. And then it'll look at other buffers in your Emacs, uh, and it'll also look in files in the file system. Okay, so this is, this is now what the interface looks like uh, once you start. So there's a, and the top is a command uh, buffer, and the bottom is a source code uh, buffer, there's this little arrow here in both places that shows you before the statement before which you're going to execute. Okay, and when you step, uh, those two things get updated automatically. So they're, they're up in the top, I'm typing step. Uh, do it. I'm sorry, what? Okay, uh, and so, so source code up, updated, there's this little gray thing that you might be able to see up there and there. Uh, and that's the prior location. Uh, and if I do another step, you'll see there's two levels of gray shading in the fringe area. And here you don't see it uh, because the source is, is sort of up there off the screen. So, but you can move, move back and forth by hitting meta up arrow. And that's what I did here. 
and I think down at the bottom it even tells you, you know, uh, what, where you are in the history there. And then a down arrow moves down. Uh, okay. And I think the next thing uh, I'm showing uh, is that, the, so I've been running the commands out of this command window, but I can run it out in the source. So there's a minor mode here that's, that's set down here where you can type single key strokes to, um, to run debugger commands. So that's coming up net. That, so that's meta x uh, debugger short key mode. Short key mode, okay. Uh, and now you see this, this short keys is in the indicator and also right here uh, the, uh, the file is now read only because when I've toggled that mode. Uh, right, so that shows that and that shows that. It says buffers read, read only. Okay, now in this mode when I hit the space bar, uh, I do a step. Yeah, okay. Uh, and step over in GDB lingo is called, and, and down at the bottom it shows you what, what, what the command that was actually run. Uh, in GDB lingo, next is, is step over, okay, and then the last thing here that I show is what a breakpoint, uh, how to set a breakpoint. Uh, do it. Okay, so I find a line that I want to set a breakpoint at, like that one, and uh, if I type the letter B, a breakpoint is now set, and breakpoints, uh, I, I think, and then I, and then I type C and I continue to that. Okay, so I can stop here. How am I for time? Okay, so there's a, so in another minute. So most of the time in, in both Ruby and Python, you don't debug um, uh, uh, from the outset like I did, but instead you, you add a call in, inside the source code that calls a debugger. That, that's a common idiom. I and mean, you can also do that in, in, in the POSIX shells too. But anyway, so here's how you do that in this new uh, Python debugger that I'm writing. Okay, and so what I'm going to do now is go into a regular comment shell, and now I'm just running Python in the comment shell. Okay, but what's not going to happen automatically uh, is because that's just a comment shell, it doesn't know uh, to, to associate a, a debugger. So do it. Uh, so there, so uh, I need to r run a command here that says, uh, it'll see it, it's debugger track mode. Uh, the first time you do it, it'll prompt you for which, which flavor of debugger you want because there are about five or six of them. And then after that, uh, uh, you'll see the source screen being synchronized. And Oh, so here we go. Debugger track mode enabled. There's, there's where it is. And then the last thing there should be... Hi there. Uh, this is going to be very quick. Hands up anybody that's still confused about why we're wearing kilts around here. Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> <You're all> <laughs> <laughs> Stand up. Stand up. Yeah. <laughs> that explains a lot. <laughs> I, the only reason I ask is because pretty much every day and sometimes twice a day people have been walking up to me and going, so what is with the kilts? Anyway, we do have some more tartan left if... Uh, uh, anybody who's interested in joining this mad band of lunatics, uh, we've got about 20 yards, which is enough for uh, uh, probably four kilts and some ties and stuff. Um, we have ties. They're not actually brilliant ties because they're way too thick, but you can make a knot out of them if you're careful. Um, and they're very nicely made. We have, uh, you can get t uh, just the cloth and do other stuff with it. Um, if people order enough of it, eventually the weavers will start keeping a stock of this stuff so I don't have to go through this pain whenever it happens. And that would be nice. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, I can do the explanation of the tartan if you like, which is that it's Morse code, goes dash dot dot, which is D, dot is E, dash dot 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 is B, dot dot is I, dot dash is A, dash dot is N. And uh, that's why it's that pattern. Uh, it's red because of the swirl, it's black, white and yellow for tux. It's blue because I like blue. And, uh, <laughs> and because of Captain Blue Eye and it's actually electric blue which seems kind of appropriate. Uh, I think that's my lot, really.
so if you, yeah, you want to actually order some, if you go to blog.hands.com and go down a couple of posts, there's something about uh, releasing Debian Totten 2.0. And uh, there's, this is the last bit that's sold. But we can do, we're making some more ties. So if you get, put yourself on the, the wiki that that points to, which is actually the DevComp 7 wiki, there's a second order table for c uh, kilts and the like. <laughs> and there's a table below that for ties. If you stick your name on there and send me an email, I'll sort that out, out next week or the week after. And uh, that's that. Right. Cheers. All right. Next up, Luciano. And uh, after Luciano is Daniel DK DKG. So um, my talk is about documenting internal workflows in an updatable way. I don't know even if updatable it's a word in English, but you know, you understand me. It's a long title for a short uh, talk. Um, so let's say that you are in a team, no? You are new in a team. In my case, I'm new in the security team. And you just want to know uh, about a deep detail or an obscure part of the process. So the people said you that you need to read the documentation, yep? I mean, the documentation. <laughs> uh, because sometimes the documentation is huge and include a wide reference, Marga says in her talk that the NM uh, documentation include the auto book, so sometimes it's something weird. Um, sometimes the documentation are not even in a single place. It can be uh, in the people's heads, for, for example. Um, and in some cases there are contradictions between, between parts of the documentations. Uh, um, also happened that many parts of the documentation uh, it's already known for you. Uh, and the parts that are not new for, new for you, well that's the part that, adds, uh, that are outdated. So it's, it's really frustrating. So because we have too many places to put our documentation, it's hard to keep it updated. And if you see something outdated, you put it in a new place. So it's, we have many places to put our documentation. So, um, so the fact is that we are uh, really bad documenting. Yeah? Most of our intention is document workflows. A workflow is a sequence of uh, connected steps. But in Debian process, uh, that can be quite hard because we have a lot of branches in our, in a, in our process. So let's, let's imagine the ultimate weight of documenting, yeah? Let's say of, uh, for at least I would like a system or, or a way to see the documentation in a big picture so I can see the complete process. And I would like to, to have a way to zoom in a little part of the process, so in short words. I would like to see something like that. Like, I mean, something where I can see the complete process. And let's, for example, I want to know more about this arrow, the, the arrow that goes from the Debian uh, maintainer to the incoming queue. So uh, in that case, I need to refer to this part of the Debian reference. So what I do is create It's create this format uh, of, of, of file. You know, it's a 822 style file. The control file it has this style, which generates something like uh, this. Yes, for example, it, this is one of the of the of the process of the um, security testing. So, if, you, if you, I want more, if I want to know more about how a, a mitre entry becomes a to-do item, I need just to click in the arrow and then I have a, a micro documentation about this part. In this way, the, the big picture uh, works as an index of little micro documents where it can be a reference to other big documents if you want more details. So we have only a single entry point to the complete uh, documentation. The green arrows means that, um, that these uh, transitions are made by uh, scripts, not by people. 
So if you, if you see in the format, um, for example, these transitions, meet for to, to do the list, are do it by a CBE polar script, yeah? And that's a description. A description uh, can be parsable in a moin moin wiki format, so you can put fancy things, yeah? The script maybe are 10 lines of Python, so you can uh, have your idea to, to collaborate with it. Um, so there is no time for your, your comments, so I put your comments for you, yeah? So <laughs> Uh, but I would like to, <laughs> I would like to know uh, more opinions. So send me an email. Next up is DKG. Or stop using passwords. After that will be. Uh, that's it. After me will be Mako um, before it squealed. So um, I have no slides. Uh, my talk is called "Stop Using Passwords." All right. Wow, that's a, that's a tough crowd. Um, I'm, maybe I'm done? I, no. Uh, so, so, okay. When I say stop using passwords, there obviously are some places where passwords are reasonable. And I'm not going to spend my time here enumerating all of the exceptions. Um, there aren't that many. Uh, so I'm just going to give a brief example of the exceptions, and you can extrapolate from there. The exceptions are when you have physical control over the entire system that deals with the password itself. So that is, if you are directly logging into your laptop, which is on your lap, um, then that's a reasonable place to have a password. Um, anything other than where you have physical control is not a reasonable place and is a, um, an opportunity for a series of uh, security flaws that uh, we are all exposed to every day and that the rest of the network is even more exposed to. Um, so we need to be advancing the state of the art in making sure that there are systems in place that do not use passwords, that do not force people to rely on passwords. So why is that? Passwords um, are designed for humans, and humans suck at them. Uh, humans are really bad at remembering uh, reasonably complex passwords. Machines are really good at generating uh, 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 password uh, dictionaries and uh, attacking human memorizable passwords. As a result, uh, either a human uses an easily crackable password, um, in which case they're screwed, or a human uses a very complex password which they then uh, transcribe into some flaky uh, technology, uh, which is often a piece of paper taped to their monitor, or taped to the wall, or they email it to themselves or whatever, in which case they're also screwed. Or they pick one password and they work really, really hard and they're very diligent and they've figured out what that secure password is and then they use it everywhere because it's so secure. Uh, right Now that's a problem because passwords are replayable. Um, and so even if you don't have the dictionary attack cap capability because the user has really worked at it and has really figured out how to remember this really strong password, they use it for a bunch of different services that they don't physically control and any one of those services can take that password and impersonate them to any of those other services. So if you find yourself using a password in a situation where you do not have full physical control, something's wrong. So what do you do? Uh, you should let the person who maintains the service know that you would prefer to authenticate to that service using something other than a password. Work with the person or people who maintain that service to find a way to do that. Most of our technology that we have today, we actually are capable of doing authentication without passwords. As Debian or as Ubuntu developers, people tend to have open PGP keys. Those are available. There are other mechanisms that avoid uh, typing your password into untrusted boxes. Um, people also like to say, okay, well, we've got single sign-on, so that solves a bunch of the problems of the password scenario. But in reality, the replay, pro the replay problem is still present for single sign-on approaches um, with, with a very few exceptions. So, for example, if you use a Kerberized domain, um, each individual host doesn't know the password of every user because it's all handed off to uh, a domain controller. But if your users are using Kerberos to connect to one system, and then they get Kerberos tickets on that system by using K in it. They type their password into that system. If that system is compromised, their password is compromised. Now everything associated with them in that domain is compromised. Now I know that's not the way you're supposed to use Kerberos, but if you have your Kerberos setup configured that way, it's likely that people are using it like that. So, uh, so I'm saying don't use passwords. I'm saying don't use passwords for sudo on remote machines. Um, I know that there, there's some controversy about how should we get uh, elevated privileges What's the best way to do that? If you use passwords for, for sudo on remote machines, 
what you are asking for is you are asking for someone to install a keylogger in, in a compromised account and capture that password. If those passwords are all different, you're asking for your users to keep some sort of crufty database of passwords around, maybe in a text file on their One hard drive. One minute. All right. <laughs> um, so, uh, so don't use passwords for sudo. Uh, think about other ways to do that. Um, don't use passwords for HTTP basic auth because of the same replayable problem. Um, there are other ways to authenticate users on, on uh, web browsers. Don't use passwords for email. I know, how could we possibly not use passwords to check our email, right? There are techniques that are available for that uh, that avoid the user actually having to transmit the password um, to the service. I saw a hand raised, Chris. Um, the, the question was, do I have any success stories of convincing organizations to not use passwords? Yeah, um, I think that Debian is on the way towards being able to do that. Uh, we certainly have the infrastructure to be possible where we can, where we can make that as a demonstration. Um, and I think that, um, so no, I don't have a full, like, complete success story where I can say, oh yeah, this, this stuff worked out. But um, Time's oh, up. Okay. We don't have time for questions. Sorry, people. <laughs> if you want to ask questions, find the person afterwards and then uh, ask them. Uh, we're, Mako's not going to be next, actually, if uh, Jamie Rollins, if you're ready, can you do it now? Can you give me your name one more time? Jamie Rollins is going to do a lightning talk on Run It. And his name, uh, who just spoke, was DKG or Daniel. Uh, so, Jamie, you ready to go? Yes. All right, do it. Yes. Um, run It. Everybody hates it, nobody knows why. That's my claim. So for those of you, who knows what Run It is? Who's used Run It? Who, th who thinks Run It is cool? <laughs> oh, come on. So I think that people hate Run It because they hate um, Dan Bernstein. But I think that's not a good reason to hate Run It. So Run It is a remake of Daemon Tools, which was DJB's um, original idea. Uh, it was made by Garrett Pape, who, if people know him, he's a pretty awesome DD. He maintains Run It, he maintains Git, he maintains a bunch of good packages. It's a super simple system for maintaining services, and it does this one thing really, really, really well. So, it's, it's a little bit weird to configure because it's not configured in the way that people are used to configuring things, but once you get over that hurdle, of configuring services to run under run it, it is really, really great. It handles, it makes making a service really easy because all you need to do is have your service run in the foreground and put its log to standard out. Everything else is handled by run it. Starting the service, stopping the service, restarting the service, uh, logging, log rotation, everything is handled by run it. If you, so, it's a good thing to use. I would like to encourage more people in Debian to think about using it and in ways that we can enable people to use it easily. One thing I would suggest is if um, package maintainers will allow people to uh, contribute run it service directories for their services. It is really easy to write a service directory for pretty much any service you can think of that hasn't been corrupted by sysv init. So, or sys5 init, or however you call it. So, most services just require a simple, like, three or four line script to run under run it. And it makes running the service really easy. I maintain multiple machines where run it is the init, is process number one, and it's, they run impeccably well. And it's, they're really easy to monitor, they're really easy to administer. The, the run it process spawns the child process, which is the service. If that process dies, the run it process automatically restarts it. So the, the, the run it process, all of the services are just children of the run it processes. So you have a very clean process tree, you have um, really easy to figure out the state of your service, look at the logs, um, et cetera. Um, so anyway, that's about it. Don't hate run it. It's very cool. Give it a try. And if you have questions about it, I will be happy to um, answer them later. That's it. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, up next is Hans. Hans? Are you going to do it, Hans? 
Okay, Hans is turning down his like, uh, Gunnar, are you ready? After Gunnar will be Wookie, so sorry, I should give you a little more heads up. Um. Okay, so, well, uh, this is a, a v very easy and fast uh, thing. Uh, we as the uh, Keyring Masters are trying to encourage people to, to st start well, we just finished uh, getting rid of the old PGP uh, keys. And yeah, <laughs> well, thanks to Jonathan, because he's the guy who's been pushing for it. And it, it was not easy. And he was extremely patient. He was, uh, well, chasing people, chasing people, chasing people, until, well, uh, we had to agree to just uh, drop those who, who didn't uh, want uh, <laughs> to be updated anymore. Well, the thing is, we don't have PGP keys anymore. And we want to uh, start switching to stronger keys for GPG. Uh, as a first step, uh, well, we have uh, not yet publicly announced it, so, uh, so this is it. Uh, uh, for people entering NM or DM, yeah, uh, uh, we are only going to take uh, keys uh, 496R uh, with uh, SHA-2 uh, capabilities from now on. People, uh, all of you who still have older, uh, less secure keys can still use them, but are encouraged to first make them uh, well connected, get the many signatures, and then uh, get them uh, updated with us. So, well, uh, <laughs> it's a public call, and uh, at some point in the future we will start being more bitchy and more aggressive, but as for now, that's just the <laughs> announcement. That's it. Thank you, Gunnar. All right, next up is uh, Wookie about Scraper Wiki. And uh, thanks to those who took less than five minutes, Wookie gets a little chance to set up before having to spend his five minutes. Uh, you may need to press the LCD at the front. Hold on a sec. Uh, <laughs> we're ready. So uh, this is uh, nothing to do with Debian at all, but uh, it's quite cool. And a friend of mine was saying, uh, you should tell everyone about this. They might like it. And uh, it came up in the bugs thing this morning. It's um, So there is the general problem of information which is on websites scattered about the world. And the only way to get it is to scrape it. And scraping is really tedious and difficult and fiddly. And people tend to do it once, and then they lose the scripts they did to do it. So uh, it's not a sustainable thing. So Scraper Wiki is an attempt to organize uh, all the world's scraping. So, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and even better than that, they got money. Um, so uh, Channel 4 uh, paid them oh, I don't know, several tens of thousands of pounds so they could actually spend three months making all this stuff work. So it's basically done. It, it, it's there. Um, so there's two parts to this. You've got a lot of distributed information. Uh, a good example was the bugs we were talking about this morning. There might be a whole lot of different bug trackers, uh, each of which needs a different scraper script to scrape. Uh, and then in order to have an overview of that, you need another script to um, use the database you generated from the set of scrapers uh, to present information in whatever form you want. Um, so obviously the net never works in here, so I just got a few screens to show you the general kind of idea. So this is uh, a typical, this is Lambeth County Council's uh, licensing website for uh, license applications for pubs and bars and so on, um, uh, which is a list of PDFs, absolutely marvellous, just what you wanted to be a, a nice data source. And in fact they're scanned PDFs just for perfect, perf perfect ease of use. Um, but in fact um, there's a trivial little scraper which uh, is about that long and uh, outputs uh, a nice little map uh, with Google blobs and if you click on each one it shows you uh, who the licensee is and where the data came from uh, and some details. So um, that's quite cool. Uh, you can do offshore oil wells. You can wander around this website. It's full of useless information like the, the towaways in Ljubljana and uh, you know, <laughs> um, really marvelous stuff. So uh, you can look at the uh, notes about it. There's a sort of chat you know, comments on the on the data, you get a history. Now, if I do this, uh, there we are. So you get a history showing you that the scripts ran and how long they took. And if we scroll down a bit, you'll find that after a bit, uh, it stopped working. 
uh, down the bottom, uh, and then someone edits the scraper again. Because the other problem is that people change their websites all the time, and your scrapers die. So obviously having the old scraper, which just needs a little tweak so that it works again, is really useful. Um, there's an API so that you can get the data that you generated out in JSON and YAML and XML and CSV files and whatever the hell else you want. Uh, and there's actually a built-in IDE in the system. So this is it. If you edit a scraper, uh, this shows you about how easy it is. You use this marvelous thing called Beautiful Soup. So you just import the whole page into a great pile of tags. And then if you just want to pull out all the data which is in TDs, you just that's it. That's the whole thing. Um, and then down the bottom here, if, if there was some internet, I could click on the Run button. Uh, and it would run it here uh, and show me what works, and then I edit it and run it again. Uh, so it's, you know, idiots can write s um, scrapers. That's basically it. Um, it's, it's pretty neat. If you have any scraping needs, this is the place to go and do it. <laughs> Thanks, Woki. Up next is uh, Christian Perrier, who will be speaking about cheese and wine over the years. Yeah, we'll try to go through five years of cheese and wine in five minutes. And I try to break the record of the number of slides in a key lightning talk with uh, 38 slides. <laughs> go. So let's go. So this cheese and wine stuff, uh, how it, it all started? Well, it started back in 2005 in Helsinki and a few pioneers, among who were we see Matt Zimmerman, I uh, wanted to just to share some cheese with friends and all, all of these pioneers were cheese amateurs. You can recognize Matt, Marco, Anna, Moray. And finally we ended up with t 10 different cheese, a few one bottles and seven people. Actually those who were here remember that there were uh, many more people at the end. And of course we had quite a long <laughs> night. <laughs> So then we moved to Huartepec uh, and then to Mexico. For the French cheese cabal was a little bit bigger at that time, so we were like seven uh, of us bringing some cheese, and we have like uh, five kilograms of cheese and some very, very good stuff, such as the Italian mortadella. And uh, we had a huge crowd and uh, too few tables. It was a very, very big mess, for those of you who remember. And of course it was great fun, and we had a long night. <laughs> then, not at DebConf, we had an intermed in Extremadura. We improvised a small cheese party in an IATN uh, meeting in Casa de Cáceres. Uh, this is the opportunity for me to introduce uh, Nicolas Francois, my cheese assistant. He's not here this uh, year, unfortunately. We had the highest ratio of cheese per participant with cut four <laughs> kilograms for 20 people, which was a little bit too much for our friend from India, I'm afraid. <laughs> and of course, we had a very long night. Then we moved to Scotland in Edinburgh. So it was a very messy cheese party because the place was very small. It was the first cheese party with kilts. We had too little space, and of course, we had a lot of fun. But we organized ourselves. We bought bread. Actually, we bought the entire stock of uh, French baguette in the local supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we had a very long night. <laughs> then we moved to Argentina. That, that was a challenge, moving to DepConf 8 in Argentina. The place was quite <laughs> nice. The venue was very well suited for a cheese party. Uh, the challenge was bringing uh, such a perishable material of uh, a very, very long trip, but we managed to do it thanks to wonderful boxes and various tricks to transport cheese over a day. The wine was, well, apparently excellent. As far as I can see, we had many good wine in Argentina. And of course, it was a very long <laughs> night. Oh, then last year, last year in, uh, Casa uh, in Cáceres, we had this very, very famous local cheese named Torta del Cazar. Um, very nice place, too, in a, in a garden outside. We had great fun with some nice things from Venezuela, as you can see. About 10 kilograms of cheese, which is really great. Oh, the first cheese party with tea, too. So that was fun also, thanks to Andrew. And, of course, we had a very long night. That was the day you should have hijacked the Python. Uh, <laughs> 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 so
So the challenge, the challenge this year was to answer this question. Here how cheese and USA fit together. Well, the pioneers were back, so that was a good sign. Finally, we had uh, we are met again with Anna and Matt also. Uh, my estimated amount of cheese for this year was 15 kilograms, which is huge. We had a very, very nice venue. Apparently, it was quite fun. And of course, we had a very <laughs> long night. <laughs> I guess some of you tried this cheese from Kazakhstan, which is the one Zach <laughs> tried. One minute remaining. And of course, the challenge now is to see you in Banja Luka, have some good cheese over there. And if you need to buy some good cheese, I suggest you try running this command line on your current laptop. That should give you good hints for good cheese. And I hope you enjoyed these cheese parties. Thank you. <laughs> I, I just forgot something. I would like to thank the people who helped organize this cheese party this year, and particularly Michelle. I don't know if she's standing around here. I, I asked her to come, but she's probably too shy. Mm -hmm. So a, a big round of applause for Michelle, who helped me a lot. <laughs> That. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Next up, uh, do we have Dr. Dub in the house? No? Well, let's a uh, quick announcement from Daniel. Uh, hey, so uh, this whole conference has been helped out tremendously by uh, the Columbia Computing Science Research Facility. Um, in particular, uh, their staff has just made uh, all the things work here. Um, so we actually have a big sheet of paper for you people to just go. There's a marker on it. It's in the CS, uh, in the, the inner hack lab there. It's on the table that has uh, t-shirts and, and these badges. Um, I invite you to just go there and sign your name and say thanks. Um, and I'll be uh, making sure that that goes along with uh, the group photo to the CS department so that they have a, a memento of the time. So if you have a chance over the next, uh, like in the next few hours, pop over to the CS Hack Lab and, uh, and sign that. Sorry? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, uh, next up we have uh, Antoine, who will do something about Iger. Do you need slides? Um, I don't have any slides prepared, but I have a computer to do a demo that will probably fail. <laughs> Can we do that? In five minutes, you will have it set up. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just gonna talk about it. Um, basically, the, well, we can try to set it up while I talk, but I'm not sure it's really relevant. Uh, basically, the Eager Project, what it is, it's uh, Drupal, website to manage a bunch of Drupals right now. That's the first objective. Uh, the reason why I'm talking about this right now is that we have another objective for the Eager project, which is, which is to go beyond that, uh, because basically hosting Drupals with Drupals is, is what we call you know, being an application service provider or so software as a service or whatever. Uh, for us, that's only a small step of what we want to do with the, with the project. In the long term, we want to rewrite our current hosting control panel software with it. So that means email support, uh, Jabber, uh, SIP connections, whatever. Uh, and the reason why I bring this up here is that we've been talking about Freedom Box for a week, and one of the things that's missing right now in the stack is the glue to you know, connect asterisk and Jabber and email and all this stuff together. And in my mind, Eager is probably the right uh, project for that because first it's based on a, an existing CMS so there's already a lot of work done. Uh, we don't need to rewrite user management and all this stuff. It's already all in place. Uh, second, there's a huge community be behind Eager because there's a huge community behind Drupal. Uh, Drupal is probably one of the most popular uh, free software CMS out there. And San Francisco, uh, about six months ago, there were 4,000 people at DrupalCon so it's really huge. There's about 4,000 modules and it happens to be, there happens to be a Facebook module in there also <laughs> if you want to try it out. I will never play with that crap, but some people like that. Um, 
what else is there? Uh, yeah, so right now we have basically Drupal support. That's the first focus of the project. So we can you know, install Drupals. You can automatically ma maintain them, upgrade them so that people don't have to do upgrades themselves so people are secure. Uh, we support multiple servers too. So you can have your development environment and migrate your sites to production servers or have multiple servers organized in a cluster uh, for load balancing purposes. Um, we support uh, the Apache uh, web server, but also Nginx. Uh, we have DNS support that's underway, that I'm supposed to be doing right now. <coughs> uh, so it's almost ready. Um, so that means bind support, but also DNS mask. Um, and we also have MySQL support. And all this is abstracted through two layers. So we have the Drupal front end, which is all modular, a bunch of modules that talks to a separate back end. Uh, and instead of giving all permissions to the web server so that you can write files and all this stuff. We keep uh, privilege separation so that there is a, u a Unix user, an eager Unix user that's separate from the web server that does the privilege operations like writing the Apache configurations files, writing the bind configuration files and restarting the daemons and doing all this stuff. Uh, so for me it's an ideal uh, target for the Freedom Box. Uh, and one of the reason, the other reason why I mention it here is that I need help in packaging this thing. Uh, I am the maintainer of the Drush package, which is the Drupal shell, which is a command line interface for Drupal, which you can use to install modules and do, do stuff like that. That's, that was the easy part. <laughs> uh, Eager is based on, on Drush, so that's the command line, the backend part of Eager is based on Drush. Uh, the stack above that is a bit more complicated because I need to package Drupal, which is already packaged for Debian, but it's not exactly the same thing. Anyways, it, you, yeah, I need basically to be able to install a bunch of Drupals because the way we do upgrades in Eager is that we copy a site over, then upgrade it so we can roll back, which means that you have multiple copies of the source One code. One minute remaining. All right. Um, so, and as per Debian policy, I think it's kind of voodoo forbidden to do things like copies of source code, so I would uh, welcome any input on that. Unfortunately, the maintainer of the Drupal project, the Drupal package is not here uh, at the conference, but if anybody has uh, ideas on how to resolve that, I'd be really happy to help. And if there are any questions regarding the Eager project, you can come and see me after or right now. How do you spell that? So, I call it Eager, I uh, pronounce it Eager. Uh, there are various pronunciations out there. In French, I call it Agir, but it's it. A-E-G-I-R. A-E-G-I-R. It's the Norse god of oceans. Because Drupal is a drop Time's of water. Up. And it's the... Next up, we have uh, Pablo, Dr. Dub. And do you need any slides? No. OK. Grab the microphone from Antoine. Thanks, Antoine. After Dr. Dub, we will have uh, Mako. Hello. So this is a project that we will start in next year with a colleague of mine in Argentina. The idea is to uh, work a little bit in automatic reverse engineering. So if you are an expert in automatic reverse engineer, come help us because we are experts on natural language processing. So imagine you get people who know computational linguistics and try to do reverse engineer for device drivers and it's all gonna end up in tears. But uh, the idea we want to try to explore is in clean room reverse engineer, you have two teams of people. In cl clean room reverse engineer refer to the fact that you want to build a device driver out of a proprietary driver without claiming that you have disassembled and copied the binary code that is inside the device driver. So for to do that, you assemble two teams of people that they don't spend time together in the same computers but they communicate through documentation. So the first team has access to the binary driver and runs uh, proprietary operating systems. Ouch. And then uh, look how the driver behaves, runs sniffers over the stream between the driver and the card, and then write a whole specification about how this particular piece of hardware is supposed to behave, and um, state machines, etc. So we want to automate that part. My, my field of expertise is natural language generation. That means having computers to automatically write text. And my friend has, uh, works on a grammar induction that might help for this uh, stuff. But uh, if you have use cases, if you have some device that you would like to use under uh, Debian, uh, 
uh, ping me on, on, on my IRC and Dr. Dab there. And uh, the other thing is that last night I was reading a paper on this stuff that was published this year from f Switzerland. If you want to read something about that, that paper is really fascinating. It's, uh, they wrote something that automatically reverse engineer device drivers for network cards. It's RevNIC. If you just search on Google R-E-V-N-I-C. What they do is they run a Windows instance in a VM, heavily modified VM, and they have no hardware on the VM. They just trap all the accesses to the hardware and they build a whole symbolic representation and from there they produce C code. Of course, that's not clean room reverse engineer, that's akin to disassembling it, but uh, there seems to be a, a fair amount of progress on, on, on this stuff. And last but not least, people who came to my talk know I'm will be teaching a natural language processing online course for free software contributors. If you are interested, uh, look for me in IRC. I'm hoping to start around October. And I'm, you know, two, three people. So far I have had one. And even with one, I most probably teach it anyway. So thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo. Big hand. Mako is next. He's giving his lightning talk. On, is it twice as big? Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. All right. So I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about lightning. Um, uh, so as anyone here knows who's uh, been in a lightning storm, at lightning, lightning is just sort of atmospheric discharge of electricity, often accompanied by thunder. Um, very quick, travels at six, 60,000 meters per second, and very hot, over 30,000 degrees Celsius. Now, um, there's a little picture of lightning up here which uh, people should know. So it turns out that a lot of people want to take pictures of lightning and that it's a little bit hard to do for a few reasons. One is that it's kind of hard to predict when lightning is going to happen. We may know that lightning will happen in a very short period of time. Li like tonight, there will be a lot of lightning, but we don't know exactly when. It also gets over and done pretty quickly. And the other problem is, is that um, we can take, if we take a camera out there to do it, it tends to rain a lot with lightning and the cameras get, tend to get wet. Um, as it turns out, free software has uh, uh, presented a little bit of a solution to this problem um, through the Canon ha Hackers Dev Kit, which is a, uh, basically a piece of um, free software firmware add-on to existing Canon cameras, um, especially cheap Canon cameras, the kind that maybe cost $100 or even $50 uh, uh, if you get them on eBay, and uh, that, that uh, uh, we don't mind when they get wet because we can always just get a new one. There are basically two ways that people have been taking photographs of lightning using CHDK. The first way was sort of a simple wait and hope method. The basic idea was to take lots of pictures over an hour, for example, um, long exposure cameras and wait and hope that, that it will work. And then the newer way, which has actually had some pretty cool results, is using motion detection. So the wait and hope method basically uses an intervalometer, that is to say taking pictures sort of repeatedly by taking long pictures and with a reasonably fast idea, um, uh, SD card, we can take uh, really have the the you know one second exposures or even you know two or three second exposures, which turns out to be about right. We can have the shutter open uh, between 80 and 95 percent of the time, so we can have a huge amount of uh, 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 photographs. And if we're looking at the sky, we're pretty likely to capture a lightning shot. Um, of course, you have this problem that with very long exposures, especially with cheap cameras, you end up with a lot of noise. So there's a method uh, called dark frame subtraction. All of this stuff happens uh, automatically using CHDK. Um, tends to work poorly during the day with those very long exposure lights. The new method is using uh, motion detection written by a user, an, uh, a contributor in CHDK, which basically uses variance in luminance uh, on the camera sensor to, uh, to, to find lead strikes. As it turns out, the way lightning works is that there's almost always a, a little lightning strike first, and then right after it, then the big one comes. So it turns out that if you can capture that first one, that the, 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 the hardware in the cameras, um, which normally we don't have access to, but with, C with CHDK, we now have the ability to manipulate, thanks free software. 
um, uh, we can actually take we can take really great lightning photography um, using very cheap cameras, and in fact, uh, better lightning photography than we can take other ways. And every photo, because it uses this intervalometer, and if you're pointing it at the dark sky, will actually have. You can just sit it out in the field, uh, maybe underneath an umbrella, and every photograph that you take will have a lightning strike on it. Um, it also works in daylight, even holding with your hand. Um, uh, the uh, pretty cool stuff. Uh, here are some examples of uh, lightning photography that have been taken with CHDK. Um, there's another one. It's pretty cool. Check out that one. Pretty awesome, right? Taken just out of some guy's window. People have, uh, people have showed up on the forums being like, there's a big lightning storm coming tonight. I really need to get this set up. Can someone help me? Um, uh, uh, this is one taken, not a great photograph, but this is actually, uh, it's hard to see with the light up here, but it's actually taken, um, uh, taken, with someone's, uh, taken in someone's hand. Uh, here's a, uh, again, pretty hard to see. Uh, is there a way to turn off the lights up here? Oh, yeah. So, so, so what's cool about, so, so this is the, uh, yeah, check that out. This is, this is one that's hand, not that great, but hand done. First, first ever hand shot lightning. What's cool about this one is that this is actually using HDR as well. So you can take multiple, um, you can take multiple photographs or photographs of the night sky immediately afterwards. It turns out that there are scripts available. You can just get them online, uh, free software, uh, put them on your camera and you can take photographs like here. Here's another HDR uh, uh, photograph. One this is minute taken remaining. In, taken in, 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 in Rimini. <laughs> Uh, uh, well, that's my, uh, that's my lightning talk, um, uh, uh, but I encourage everyone to sort of get involved and do this. Um, uh, you, can, you can get some pretty great uh, photographs uh, of lightning, and so, great. Oh. There's one other thing that I'll say. One other thing I'll say is that one of the problems with many of these photographs is because they're taken at night, they're often very dark. So sometimes you need to do a little bit of lightening. And if I'd had a little bit of uh, extra time, I might have shown you how to do the lightening in GIMP. So. Thank you, Mako. Mako is, uh, not only was his talk about lightning at a lightning talk, and it was actually five minutes long, but he also made all his slides in about five minutes in the hallway. So he's like meta Mako. Um, if someone can grab the lights, maybe. Um, F next is going to be Jaldar. Well, the Vyas, I'm going to uh, talk about the uh, Debian port to Minix. Um, for those who don't know, uh, Minix is an academic uh, operating system. It was designed to be uh, taught as part of an operating systems course. And it's actually uh, uh, quite, uh, has quite a long pedigree. But mainly it's been languishing in the uh, university world. In fact, uh, Linux basically exists because uh, Linus was frustrated with not getting patches into Minix because they wanted it to keep it simple for uh, uh, teaching purposes. But uh, lately, uh, the development of Minix, uh, it's Minix 3 now, which is a slightly newer version of it, uh, has uh, accelerated and it has a lot of uh, more modern features. And it's interesting in itself because it's a microkernel based uh, operating system uh, with uh, all the things that um, you know academic types think should be in an operating system. Um, you may know that uh, there was a famous spat between Andrew Ta Tannenbaum, the author of Minix, uh, and uh, Linus about how uh, old and obsolete and out of date the design of Linux is. Uh, but uh, that, 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 that was uh, mainly a theoretical kind of discussion, of course, and Linux won and Minix didn't. But um, I, I got interested in this about uh, three years ago. Uh, the only problem was that I wrote about it on my blog, so most people assumed it was some kind of uh, arcane joke, uh, which for some reason tends to happen to things I write about on my blog. Uh, but uh, I have actually been uh, noodling away at this for this time. I had like a uh, disk crash and other kind of uh, dead ends and so on and lost interest for a while and came back to it. Um, but uh, l in the last, uh, I would say, month or two, uh, things have started accelerating on the, uh, uh, on the Debian front as well. Um, 
the big problem I have is that uh, one, I'm actually mainly a Perl guy. I really don't know very much. Uh, I took a course in operating systems in college, but I uh, think I must have basically uh, dozed through it because I can't, for the life of me, remember that much about uh, what we actually did. But, uh, uh, you know, I've been just uh, learning as I go and uh, trying out things and porting things bit by bit. Uh, like I said, Minix is uh, developing very fast as well. So every, like, couple of weeks, I have to go back and review all my patches and redo them for things that have been added and taken away. Uh, mainly, I just wanted to say uh, what the state status is so far. I was actually hoping to have uh, dpackage working and devs built uh, during devconf. Um, you can actually run dpackage right now, but it will immediately segfall. So it's not entirely usable uh, right now. <laughs> um, but uh, is there? Well, GDB also has not been ported, uh, or strace, or anything beyond like sticking printfs in the code everywhere, which is how I've been de debugging things so far. Uh, but uh, uh, there's uh, some, I've been working with the Minix developers uh, that hopefully will make some uh, changes to libc uh, that I need and, and that thing will go away soon. Um, I am uh, going to work next on porting uh, the uh, latest uh, bin utils, GCC and so on to get them up to uh, uh, squeeze uh, versions. And uh, then hopefully soon after that, I will actually have something that I can pass around and get some more uh, interest uh, in that. Uh, and I'll take questions later, but in the limited time I have remaining, I just wanted to share one other piece of uh, completely unrelated good news. Um, there's a mini DevConf going on in India right now in the city of Pune. And uh, they had capacity for 50 people. They were expecting about like 20, 30 to, uh, 30 people to show up. They got like I think close to 200 people registering. So about, uh, you know, n not all of those 200 uh, attended, but about 140 to 150 they're saying. And uh, they're doing uh, bug squashing, key signing, t-shirts and tutorials and all that stuff. So hopefully by the next DevConf we might be seeing a lot more faces from India. Cool. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Just one last thing, uh, Karthik Mistri, who's a Debian developer, will, uh, was the organizer, and I'm sure he'll be blogging more details about that. Right. Thank you, Jaller. Uh, thanks, uh, everybody. This is the end of the lightning talks. Thank you, everybody who presented, and sorry if uh, some people couldn't do it, but uh, we're out of time. Uh, we're going to have about a uh, well, big round of applause for everybody who did a lightning talk. <laughs> yeah. um, we're going to take a, a five minute break and then we're going to do the closing plenary and that will be the last thing at DevConf. So you